in Beaver, Oklahoma at the, Pine, at the uh, Jones and Plummer Trail Museum on September the 13th, 1984. I'm interviewing Charles L. Barons. Yes. Did I s pronounce that right? <laughs> uh, okay. Barons, that should be, most of them call it Barons. But it's Barons. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Charlie, let's begin with grandfather on your father's side that came from Germany. Tell me about him. Well, I couldn't tell you much about it because I never, I've never seen either one of my grandparents. Yes, you just um, remember your father talking about yes. them. Yes, my grandfather was a shoe cobbler there in, in Germany. In Germany. Mm -hmm. And where did he land when he came? Well, they landed in New York. And do you know the year? No, I don't. Uh-huh. No. All right. Uh, what about the grandmother? Well, I never seen a, my grandmother. You never the, saw your grandmother uh, either, but um, she came from England, you told me. Yeah, my, my mother came from England. Oh, your in mother? Yeah. And her parents didn't come? Yeah, they, they came, came across. Her she, parents came across too. Yeah, I see Eliza S. White. She was born June the 30th, 1862 in Bedfordshire, England. Mm -hmm. She came across coming to the United States when nine years of age with her parents in a sailboat. It took six weeks to come across, to make the trip across. They got in a bad storm once and the wave turned the ship over on the side that was quite a mess, and my uncle Joe White, of course, when that happened, well, the people naturally panicked, mm -hmm. and my uncle Joe White got in the cabin door and kept the passengers from coming out and getting rid of the sailors so they could work, and pretty soon another wave turned the ship back up, and they come on across then, and, <laughs> and they landed in New York. Well, that's quite a story. On election day, and they wouldn't let them wouldn't let them unload until last election that was over. Oh, and what year was that? Well, I don't know the year. You don't know the year? No. Mm -hmm. And then from New York, they went to Michigan and settled there and stayed there in, until 1868. Then later moved to Castleton, Kansas. This is where she met and married Jacob Burns on November the 10th, 1880. Uh huh. And then after they was married, they went to Grand Center, Iowa, where my dad's brother, Fred Barnes, lives. And uh, he ran the Grand Center foundry and machine shop for several years. I don't know just how long, because they don't have no record just how long. Yes. And then well, while he's working in the machine shop there, he was building the windmill, making a windmill. There wasn't many windmills in the country them days. Yes. He had one just almost done, and his shop caught fire one night and burned up and burned all his tools and everything and lost everything he had. And my mother, she, when you come on home, he was up there, and she was down at uh, Pretty Prairie, Kansas, down there with her mother. Yes. Her, her father was bad sick then, mm -hmm. and so she wrote a letter to my dad up there, and one didn't come home, but he said that him and his brother Fred and Ben had made a bid on an elevator to work on an elevator then. If they got, got the job, they could make a hundred dollars, mm -hmm. but said if they didn't, didn't get the job, why, he was going to come on home right away. Mm -hmm. And I have letters that showed that they lived there in Grundy Center from 1889 to, or 1887 to 1889, but I'm sure they lived there longer than that. Yes. But I have some letters that were written back and forth yes. then. That shows that they were there at that yeah. time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And my grand, Grandpa White, I've got 
is here somewhere. My grandfather Ephraim White died. My grandfather Ephraim White died, and they buried him December the first, eighteen eighty-seven. He had the Bright's disease and suffered terribly in the last. Mm-hmm. Then what did uh, what did your grandmother do after your grandfather died? Well, she lived there on the place, and she finally married Joe White, but they separated. He went off and left, and she left the rest of her life alone. Mm-hmm. And she's the only one of my grandparents I ever seen was my grandma White. I see. Now, was this Joe White? Uh, was he? Uh, he was an uncle. An uncle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Okay, and did your father go down to where your mother was after the fire, or did she yeah. go up there to him? No, he finally moved down there, yeah. down there at Castleton, Kansas. Mm-hmm. And then from there is when they come out here to Beaver County and located out here. See. How did they come out, did they? Well, come? my father and my oldest sister, Maud, and my oldest brother, Fred, mm-hmm. come out of the covered wagon, mm-hmm. and the two kids there rode the horse back, rode bareback, drove some, they had a few cattle, I don't know, just a few cattle. Mm-hmm. They rode behind, drove the cattle through from Prairie Prairie, Kansas down there to Beaver County. And what year? In 1891. Oh my. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And long in the early fall, I think, of 91, when they came down. Mm-hmm. My mother stayed there, t- up there with her mother, because mm-hmm. She was expecting Joe any time then, and she mm-hmm. stayed there. And Joe was born the 9th of November in 1891. Mm-hmm. And then my mother and my two sisters and the baby, Joe, they come down on the train to Inglewood. And my dad met them there at Inglewood mm-hmm. with the white team and wagon. And they started out, went out south from Inglewood. And they got down to where Nice Maffet lived. That's the neighbors who lived about two and a half miles east of where we were. Mm-hmm. They stayed all night there. They they come out on the 24th of December in 1891. Mm-hmm. And they stayed all night there at the Nice mm-hmm. And then they ate Christmas dinner the next day with the Maffets. And then went on home up to the homestead. And they homesteaded on in the southwest quarter, section 32, township 6, range 28. Is that where you are living That's now? That's where I'm living now. That's where you, uh, what uh, kind of a house did your father fix for you? Well, the first, first house he built, he just dug back in the bank, mm-hmm. and he walled up the north side and the west side, and the south and east was board. Mm-hmm. He just dug back in the bank there and mm-hmm. made that as a temporary house. That's where the well, the first winter they had to live with my Uncle Ben. And they had a little dugout already made down there, and the two families had to stay the first winter together there. Yes. While he was building the other house. Yes. And the two families living there, and it's just a little old house, and there's something kind of queer. There was two cowboys. That, you see, that is all open range and a lot of cowboys and yeah. there's two of them was boarding at uh, Battles that was right south of where my dad's place was mm-hmm. and then two cowboys would come down there to Uncle Ben's house every night and sit there and play pitch till 12 or 1 o'clock sometimes my dad got so tired of playing pitch that he never would play pitch after <laughs> that's one reason I never did learn how to play cards I see <laughs> Just too much of a good thing. Yes. And then later, well, they, well I, I'll tell you a little. The next spring in 92, mm-hmm. uh, they was living in a house, and Joe, my brother, was just a baby then. Mm-hmm. So my mother and two of the older kids took a team and wagon went out on the prairie to pick up cat chips for fuel mm-hmm. and left my sister Edith there 
to take care, take care of Joe while she was gone. Mm-hmm. And she had him laying out on a quilt out in front of the house there in the sunshine is along in the late spring. And an old low-code cow come in from the southwest heading towards the river to get a drink and seen this baby laying there and made a run for that. And we had an old dog there to call Ponto. And the old dog just ran out there and grabbed that cow by the nose and just led it on around that. And when, when he turned it loose, the cow went on to the river. <laughs> well, how marvelous. My, that, that dog was worth keeping. Yes. He had a place to stay the rest of his yeah. life, I'll bet. Yeah, he stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> and then later on, well, it was about, I think about another year later when they lived in this first house and while they were digging the basement, the basement they lived in later and where mm -hmm. the house is built over now, mm -hmm. it was 18 by 28 feet. Here's a bigger building he dug yeah. that out there, and then he walled all the sides with rock. Mm -hmm. And them days, they didn't have no money to buy cement, and there wasn't, wasn't really money, much cement to buy. Mm -hmm. My dad went over in the Red Hills across the river there and found a kind of rock over there. And he brought that over there, and he made a kill there, and he just put this rock in that fire and burned it. Mm -hmm. And they'd just get brittle, and the only kind of crumb left. And he had to feed my mill there that he brought out the country with him to get dry and feed, you know. For, mm -hmm. And he run that uh, rock through that grinder and grind it. Mm -hmm. And that's what he used to make mortar to lay up them rock walls with. Well. And that's still today is still just as sound as that was. What kind of rock was it? Do you have well, any idea? Kind of a quite like rock. Limestone? Well, it's, well, it looks just a little bit like some of this isinglass. It had a little, you know, oh. kind of like that color. Mm -hmm. And when you burn it, well, it'd get brittle and don't break out. Yes. And you ground that. And there's a lot of places in them rocks where that's exposed to the weather. Mm -hmm. And it's still pretty it's good. Of course, there. there's some places where it's washed out to have had to put cement mm -hmm. over the top of it. Yes. But them walls are just as sound as they ever were. Well. And, uh, and That'd be interesting to know what what type of rock that was. Yeah. Okay. And when they, when he built the dug out there, they didn't have any money to buy lumber to put a roof on it. Mm -hmm. So they just took the, in the center put a ridge log there, cottonwood log, mm -hmm. and then they put poles over there like rafters, mm -hmm. and then put brush on top of that, and then hay and then dirt on top of that. Mm -hmm. Of course, the house wouldn't leak when it was raining, but a lot of times it leaked for three or four days after the rain was over. <laughs> yes, that'd have to soak down. Yes. And about 1903, we got to having chills. About every third day, we'd have chills. My dad would have one day, and my brother Arthur one day, and me one day. Mm -hmm. and just as regular as the third day come around, we'd get them chills. Mm -hmm. You just think he's going to freeze to death. I imagine, I remember one time a bunch of us kids was playing down the sand rows, a nice warm sunshiny day, and I felt the chills coming on. It was my day. And I started for the house, and by the time I got the house, I was a shivering and shivering. <laughs> well, did you find out what caused it? Yes. Dr. Dugan was a doctor in this for the chills, and he told us we'd have to get rid of that old moldy, musty roof off that old house. Mm -hmm. to ever get rid of that chill. Mm -hmm. So my dad then tore that all off and got lumber and raised the north or the east side and made a sloping roof and then put a board roof and paper over top of it. We got all the chills and never had more trouble with it. Well, there and was something about that. Yeah, it was just that uh, moldy stuff in that mm -hmm. old roof there just, just gave us the chills. Yes. And then... <coughs> then in 1906, about that time of year, why everything was, all the wheat and everything was cut with headers and binders, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a, the thrashers would come around later and they'd first thrash the bundles, and then they'd come around later and thrash the stacks ground. Mm -hmm. And it was usually kind of hard 
we had just come down just a little neck down the next river. There wasn't too much farming right around there. They stayed up on the higher ground, you know. Mm -hmm. And they, Jake Nunn saw him. They had an old thrash machine. And he was coming in there to Madras to thrash his wheat for him. And they pulled into that sand door right there for the place. It was just pure white sand and dry. And pulled in there and got stuck. And they had to cable out and put the engine out on the hard ground and attempting to try to pull that separator out of there they stripped all the cogs off in that big main drive here on the old steam engine mm -hmm. and there's an old engine they couldn't couldn't get a new one because it's an old engine and they'd had to order and they'd had to make one so there's no other way and my dad couldn't he just make one and the engineer that was running, his name was Rick Mason. He used to live right up there in the community there. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't think he'd make one. But my dad told him he's going to make one. And I asked him how he's going to melt the metal. The Megan told him he's going to wash it. Melt it in the wash tub. And they kind of laughed at him about that, but he did. But he didn't say what he's going to do with that tub before he... So he just... <laughs> took that the ordinary big wash tub and then he put about two or three feet of tin above that and made it oh, it would be about that high now about four feet high about four, four feet high mm -hmm. and he just lined that all around inside with brick and clay and just made a furnace out of it oh. and then he had a hole on both sides where he could put a my dad had a blacksmith bellus and Jake Nunn's one had one and they put one on each side mm -hmm. and then he took this uh, gear out of the engine they had to take this old money in order to make that on there because it had to be keyed on that shaft and you didn't have no way to key and make a key seat or anything because you didn't have no machinery like that mm -hmm. so he just had to take that shaft and just bury it right down in the ground and then he made a pattern just like that well he, he didn't even have a turn light he had to use on a little grindstone and then took a piece of cottonwood log and put it on there, and he could, you could put a chisel on there and turn that on and make that gear. It was about eight inches in diameter and about six inches across the face of it. Mm -hmm. And he turned that out and had to make a hole in the center that you just spit down over that shaft. Mm -hmm. And he put his wooden cogs and nailed on there just like the wheel would be. Mm -hmm. And, and he made his pattern. Made the pattern mm -hmm. out of that. And mm -hmm. that pattern's out in. Goodwill in the museum out oh, there. But they lost track of it some way. I'm trying to they're looking for it, trying to find it. And I want to bring it back down this way. Sure. And after he got everything all ready, he, he just buried this shaft right in the floor of the shop, right by where he had his furnace built, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. They got everything ready. Well uh, what they did they make a box around them and they use what they call a mold of sand. They just it'll just pack in there tight around there, but it won't then you can lift that pattern lift that pattern right out of there and just leave a hole in there now. Oh, uh -huh. And then on the top of it so we can take that out, they take this coal dust around the blacksmith forge, you know, and just yes. spread that on sprinkled on top then and then the two st wouldn't stick together. Mm -hmm. And when it gets around you just lift that top of them there lift that pattern out of there easy mm -hmm. and they set that right back on there and he had a hole poked through the right through there so it, it is right under the furnace there mm -hmm. so all they had to do is poke a rod in there when they got that they had this full of coke you know and got the fire started good and hot and then they went to throw them had this broken up piece of cast iron and on top of the fire. Mm -hmm. And after that melted all melted down to the bottom, and then he poked a rod in there and opened the hole and that metal come running out there and down into that gear. And I my brother Arthur and me and I was just a kid and well just a kid and they wouldn't let us in there. We had to watch them though. We stood out in the road outside and mm -hmm. watched them through the door. After they got that all done, well, then they just left that set there in the ground there all night to cool off. Mm -hmm. And the next day when they took it out of there, well, all they had to do was take a file and 
smooth that up a little bit and was ready to put in the machine. And he put it in and went ahead and wore out the rest of the machine. Well, that was back in well your father was really talented in yeah. that way, wasn't he? Yeah, he could, any kind of mechanical work, anything like that, he could, people used to come there from miles around there. If they couldn't, had a job of work, they couldn't just get done somewhere else. Mm -hmm. They'd come to him to get it done. And he'd never take a job unless he could figure out how he could fix it. Mm -hmm. But he'd study that out, and if he could fix it, to figure out how he could do it, well, he'd fix it. That's the way, reason he fixed that gear. He knew he could do it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, well, that was quite a One other time, then, uh, well, that was when the cars first began to come out. There was a traveling salesman come through there one time. He was selling books and this old car. In them days, they didn't have no starters and generators on them, batteries. And for ignition, they had a magneto set on a block. It is a aluminum crankcase, and this little bracket set out to one side. Mm -hmm. And this magneto set on there for the ignition, though, to run the car. Mm -hmm. And on these country roads, he hit a chug hole and got the bracket off and that, <laughs> broke that bracket off in there. And how you reckon he'd put that back on? There's no way to weld aluminum them days. They didn't yes. have no torches, nothing. Mm -hmm. But he figured out how to do it. But he had to just take that motor completely apart, just the same with just like and put it down the sand just like you did when there's mold in the new one, mm -hmm. and put this piece, broken piece, right up there at the side, so we could just take a, the top off of it and just pick that out of there. Mm -hmm. And then he just made it so he could, he'd melted a lot of aluminum, and he'd just put it in one hole and let it go right on through and come out on, right on out. Poured enough through there that it got hot enough, it melted right back to the other, original crankcase and when it came out it's just like a new one again. Well, and what kind of a car was it? What well, I forget what you, make it was. You know, it's some remember. big car. Mm -hmm. Out back, I was just, just pretty much for kids yet. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, what did your mother do? What was her day's work? Well, she was just, liked to work in the garden. Raise flowers. She was mm -hmm. a great one to raise flowers. And she never did like to run around much. She never never cared to go to town. Mm -hmm. She always just stayed at home. She, you people used to come there and look at her flowers and admire her flowers. And she always had house plants in the wintertime and mm -hmm. flowers in the garden in the summertime. Mm -hmm. She used to furnish flowers for weddings and funerals and stuff. And well. But she never cared much to run around. If, mm -hmm. if there's something, the town she wanted to go, or she'd go to town and get it, and then she's ready to go back home. Mm -hmm. But she, that to her was her main, just. Mm -hmm. That was her. That's the, that pleasure. That's just what to, her pleasure was. Just to watch her flowers grow yes. in her garden. And she always had lots of pretty flowers. Uh huh. And uh, I suppose she raised a big garden and yes, did a lot of canning and. Had lots, you had fruit trees. Yeah, we had all kinds of fruit there. We had mm -hmm. all, oh, I bet there's a dozen different kind of apples. And we had peaches and cherries, mm -hmm. two or three different. And we had about three different kinds of pears. And then we had crab apples. We had one what they call a transcendent crab. And then we had the Florence crab. And then a Siberian crab. And it was all just a little different. Well, that was just sort of a paradise down yeah, there. Yeah, and we had had three grape rows run mm -hmm. clear through there about, oh, they'd be about 200 yards long. Mm -hmm. and when I, you got old enough to go to school, what school did you go to? Well, I went to what's called Riverside District Number 40. Mm -hmm. It is known around the country there as a burn school because most of them went to school there was burned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, you graduated from the eighth grade there, I suppose. Yeah, Did you go I, on to high school? No, that's as far as I ever went. As far as you went. Mm -hmm. I got smart enough and made a living, that's all that was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I never have had to go on to relief or nothing. I've always made my own way. <laughs> um, what, uh, what was your
your chores around home. Well, Every kid had to have special chores for them well, to do. What was I yours? used to help feed the hogs and mm -hmm. feed the chickens for the time. Then we used to milk a few cows. I had to help do the milking. And mm -hmm. then I liked horses all the well. And of course, I took care of the horses quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And after I got older, well, then I just well I went to raising them registered quarter horse there for several years, have been for 25 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. You raise them to sell? Yeah, I raise them to sell and I keep some of the good ones to ride home. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, tell me about the uh, the river and uh, the floods on the river. And well, so I can tell you pretty good about that 1914 flood. Anything before 1914 you want to tell me yeah, about? Yeah, from 1895 to 1900. Okay. Well, in the early days, the river at that place uh, come in on an angle from the northeast and the northwest, and then hit the bank and then kind of turned off on an angle to the northeast. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the river crossed the uh, fence line on the north side. My dad took a notion I need to just make a floodgate across there so he wouldn't have to put in water gaps every time the river come up a little. Mm -hmm. So he got, they had to go clear down there, what they call cedar hills down there, were Woodard. Mm -hmm. Go down there and cut cedar posts and he went down there and got five good straight cedar posts about 16 feet long. And he drove two on each bank and one in the middle and then he braced from the top of one to the bottom of the other and then from the top of that and into the ground and he stretched the cable clear across the river mm -hmm. and built a floodgate that just hung on that cable there and it just swung under there. It was just high enough that the water wouldn't catch it on when the river was up mm -hmm. and there come a flood where it swung out and on and when the water went down it go back down that way it didn't have to build no water gaps. Mm -hmm. And that done, done fine until in April in 1900, there was a big flood come down the river there. And it was just almost up to that cable they had across the top of the river there. But the floodgate was standing all right until a big tree come along there and washed out and caught that and broke the cable. And of course, that was the last of the floodgate. Well. Well, that sounds very plausible. If it hadn't been for that tree, that yeah, it'd have been, been all right. It'd been all right. But mm -hmm. when that one came in fourteen, that'd have took them all out. Of it. <laughs> it would. I've got to. But let's see. You told me about a time that you and your brother was uh, uh, swimming in the river, and uh, uh, your sister or somebody got to calling you that there was a a big water. Well, it's a uh, 1914 flood. Is that it? Yeah, that's... Okay. That was on, Tell us about that. On May the 2nd, 1914, there was a major flood came down the Cimarron River. Something we'd never seen before and never seen since. Mm -hmm. And that... Well, we got a telephone call during the night of May the 1st between and uh, there was a flood coming down from out in western Oklahoma. And I'd all, I always wondered ever since that where that flood started from, the way it come down so fast. Mm -hmm. But when I, I went out there to the Black Mesa out there last summer, took that bus tour they have out there, and I yes. seen where them floods could originate from. Yes. And I've got a record here of that flood out there, and I've got the record from right all, all down here, down two together, it'd make oh. a quarter. Quite a story. Oh, it would, wouldn't it? And I've got that. And you've got them both. Well, yeah, I've got. I've Have got you got this. someone working on it? No. And well, we, the, it, we'd been having a lot of rain that spring. It'd been awful wet, and the ground was all soaked up, and so there wouldn't hardly any more water go in, you know. And mm -hmm. on May the first. We had a heavy rain, rained about three and a half inches at night of the May the 1st. Mm -hmm. And out there in 
in Cimarron County. It they said out there it rained for about a week before, and then the last night, on the last day of April, well, I said the heavens just opened up and just turned it all loose, and that flood come down out of there, and there was two or three people drowned out there. Oh, it was just like a big wall of yeah. water coming down. And when it got on down here, and that rain just is moving down the river just far enough ahead mm -hmm. to keep all the canyons and creeks and everything just dumping in on top of it. Mm -hmm. And by the time it got down here, is it uh, hit that uh, just about 10 o'clock when it hit there. And that morning, uh, May the 2nd, is my job to always take the milk cows down the road and take them down the road and put them in the pasture down about a half mile further east. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I come back, then it's too wet to do anything else, so I stopped at Michael Ben's place, and my two cousins, Bert and George Burns, and me took off for the river. And the river was about a half mile north of their place, and we went clear down there. And the river was banked full that morning. And we just fooling around down there, and there's a man up on the hill up there. could see that flood coming, and we couldn't see it from down there. Yes. And he was waving to us, trying to get us out of there. We seen him, and we just thought he was afraid we was going to fall in the river, and we wasn't scared of it. <laughs> so we just fooled around there a long time. And finally, the river started to raise again. There was just a bank full that morning. Mm-hmm. And there was telephone poles and stuff going by there, and we tried to catch some of them and couldn't. So we decided to go up to the barn and get a rope and come back and try to rope some. Got up there a little further, and the re reason we couldn't see that, at that time this old wild cane growed on both banks, you know, mm -hmm. up seven, eight feet high, we couldn't see over the top of it. Mm -hmm. And we started to walk up there, was going to go up to the barn, we looked up the river there, right across the trees, and looked like a waterfall there, about six foot high, just right across the river. We couldn't figure out what that was. We'd never seen anything like that before, and so we started on up and walking a little faster to go up there, and first time we seen uh, what that was, this wall of water come down over the west bank of the river, just about 100 yards from us, and we was just on the east bank, and here's a wall of water about six foot high and just about a mile wide, just plumb across mm -hmm. the whole bottom. And there we was down there in, mm -hmm. in the river. And we took out south, and we didn't go very slow either. <laughs> no, I don't think. <laughs> of course, we were going up grade all the time, going yes. south. Mm -hmm. But the water spread out around south of us, and we was in water waist deep before we got out. Oh. There. And after we got up, got out of there, we went up on the bank right north of the grove of trees there at the home place. Just mm -hmm. stood there and watched it. And you look out across there, it's a mile wide just out across there, just nothing but water. Mm -hmm. And you, anything that float was going down there, you could see small buildings, haystacks, and everything just going mm -hmm. down there. And I don't know how many drowned the cattle were seen floating down along there. And the driftwood and stuff is so thick on the top of that water that it picked up all the way along. Come so fast, you know, yes. that, that uh, it hit about 10 o'clock on May the 2nd, 1914. And the river come up. And then by about 4 o'clock, it started to fall in just a little bit. So there was a little island began to show up across out in the pasture there. Mm -hmm. But there was an old riverbed where the river used to run before the 1900 flood. It changed mm -hmm. and went straight through. Yes. And my oldest brother, Arthur, and my cousin, George, or Bert Burns, him, they was older than me and I was the next. Mm -hmm. So we waded across this old riverbed there. There's it had got down enough so we could wait. It was about all we could do to get across. Mm -hmm. Went over to this island to make it closer to the to where the main river channel was. Yes. Where it was cutting on this high bank. Mm -hmm. And when you got over there, them waves just made so much racket, you just couldn't hear nothing. Hmm. Them waves would get to going up, you know, and just rolling over backwards. Hmm. And I bet they were going 15 or 20 feet high sometimes. Oh, my. And on this bank over there, the red bank there is about, run from about 30 feet 
high at, at the west end is about 10 feet high and at the east end about 30. Mm -hmm. And they're cutting that bank back there at the rate of eight steps or five steps an hour, just caving off and just walking And you away. boys were going over to that? No, we were just getting over there close to the river where oh, we could see it. I see. Where are you Because the river was just going out straight through there. It never yeah. paid no attention to the bends as it had been making. It was just yeah. going straight through. We got over there and stood there, and I finally got, got scared out. I was, I was only about 13 years old then. I decided I was going back across the other side. So I made it back across the old riverbed to where it was up on the second base there, and I thought it was all right, and started walking along there. I fell in the hole that washed out and just went in all. <laughs> oh, my. Could <laughs> you me. swim? Yeah, I could swim, but just, just a little ways there, but I sure got wet all over. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That was about about five o'clock in the evening when we went across over there. It went down just enough, as a, but it stayed up for about than a week to where they couldn't cross it. Mm -hmm. Finally, in about oh, several days later, on my brother Joe, he swam the river and come across just to see what this thing was on the other side. Mm -hmm. And my brother's place was north of the river. And they was caught on the south side over there at home, and their house was on the north side of the river, and that bank was cutting along there, and they afraid he was going to get his house. So some of the neighbors over there stayed there all night there, and in case it got close enough where they going to get the house, or they could move stuff out. Mm -hmm. But it kind of got up there about 100 yards of the house, and it finally... The river went down enough to quit cutting them. Well, but it, later on, it's finally cut some out. But he tore the house down, moved out, and he rented a place up on the Cookie Creek, about three or four miles above there, and stayed there for about a year. And, and his wife had land out in Colorado, out there in back of County, Colorado. Mm -hmm. So they moved out there then and lived out there for mm -hmm. till about 1923. And her folks used to all live around there, but they'd all moved to Idaho. Mm -hmm. And she got the one to go out there where the rest of them were. And so they, they went out finally there. sold her personal property there. And well, 23 uh, then took a model T and went to Idaho. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't been out there hardly a year. And my brother was helping putting up hay out there. They had what they call hay derricks that they stacked. Mm -hmm. There's a big, tall, and had a cable over the top of it that they used stacking hay. Mm -hmm. And they was moving out in under one of them high-powered high lines out there. And that cable come in contact with that high line and the electricity come down and electrocuted my brother and burned another bad man pretty bad and killed some of the horses. Had left her out there with a bunch of kids there and no husband. Yes. But she stayed out there and made a go of it. Oh, she did. Well, yeah. that's great. Well, now, you young boys, I know how boys are. They're full of curiosity. They want to see what's on the other side of the hill. Uh, you did a lot of roaming, I'm sure. Did you run across any Indian uh, villages? Yeah, there's two or three of them. Can you tell me about some of them? Well, there's one right there in, in the pasture. It's what they call the flint factory, where they hauled the flint in. See, all the flint that they had for air making was had to be hauled in. Yes. And they'd haul it in there, and then that was a place in the canyon there, and there's a big hill on both north and west of it where they made an awful nice winter camp there. Mm -hmm. And that's where they made their arrowheads. Mm -hmm. And there used to be chicken with a Flint all around there used to be a lot of arrowheads found there. Mm -hmm. And back in the bank on the south side, about six feet and under the ground, where you can dig out burnt bones and ashes and stuff in there where the hills eroded down over the top of it and on yes. the curves up. Mm -hmm. But there used to be just lots of it. It's been picked up now so much there that there's not very much left there. And then up the, on the horse creek, just south of the river, there used to be an Indian village on the west side of the creek there that they found a lot of artifacts and stuff there. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, during that time there was a 
having quite a bit of Indian trouble here. There's one of the old neighbors up there that was in the cavalry when they was having the Indian trouble. Mm -hmm. And they had a, quite an Indian battle up there on the Cimarron, right where the river makes it about to turn to the north, and that's right there on my dad's place. Yeah. And it was right on the, at the mouth of the horse creek, right south of the river, is where the, and they, oh, I hear so, well, back there in the 30s when the C.C. boys was around, done a lot, of, and that Dr. Thoburn, he done a lot of digging around over there and found a lot of stuff there, and they found several places up there, found these brass buttons off in the army, army uniforms. Mm -hmm. And they dug up several Indian graves up there, and some of the soldiers' graves. Well, uh, well, who won the battle? Well, I don't. You don't know. Don't know. Uh huh. And this uh, Doctor Thoburn, he got a lot of stuff there, but before, after he went back home, before he got it all turned into the state, well, he died, and one of his daughters didn't want to turn that over to the state. Oh. They had a quite a difficulty there about that, but I guess they finally They finally got it finally didn't got it settled some way. Well, um let's see, I was gonna ask you something. Um Oh, what tribe of Indians do you know? Well I think it was Apache, but I wouldn't be sure on that. Uh huh. Well General Castro was in the, oh, was he in the yeah, he was, he in was, the group of soldiers mm -hmm, that was yeah. fighting the Indians? Mm -hmm. What were they trying to do? Run the Indians off or back well, on the reservations or what? Well, what it was, the white men was coming in here and killing all the buffalo, you know. Mm -hmm. And that is their Indians' food. Yes. Of course, you couldn't blame the Indians for no. protecting their food. Mm -hmm. But that's where the most of the battle was caused. They tried to run the white people out. Yeah, they tried to run the white people out. And of mm -hmm. course, the white people, they was killing the buffalo at all. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, well, you can't blame the Indians, no, can you? No, you can't. Well, I went up west of your place when, the, uh, when the Don Wyckoff was out there uh, looking at a site. Yeah. That was really uh, educational for me. Yeah. I'd always wanted to go to a dig, what they call a dig, yeah, you they, know. They dug out a quite a lot of stuff yes. like that. And uh, uh, I wrote, uh, and I've got pictures of that in this last book. You've yeah. seen that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Don't you think along that river, even the prehistoric river bed, that there were a lot of Indians back before the white man came? Well, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that is all room the uh, Indians there. And in the prehistoric days, do you think that was the riverbed or was it someplace else? Well, there's indications there that that riverbed has been a lot lower than what it is. Than what it is now? Uh, right there, just trust my place there, my nephew and me started Dig an irrigation well, we dug it, hand dug it. Mm -hmm. We got down there about 45 feet. And underground, we dug out these mussel shells. Oh. Just a lot of them. I've got a bunch of them up at home yet. Just some perfect yet. Yes. Dug out about 45 feet and underground. Well, that would indicate a riverbed. Yeah, that had to be a riverbed there. Mm -hmm. And then just on top of the hill west of there, They've opened up a gravel pit there, and that's the cleanest, best gravel that they found anywhere put in the state. Is that right? Well, that would indicate a river yeah. bed too. And it's sure deep. They've well, they've been hauling out of there for a couple of years now, mm. and they in one place they've they've dug down at least sixty feet, and they still haven't went through that sand gravel yet. It's just as good down the bottom as right on top. Well, what do you think about the Gate Lakes? You remember when the water raised down there yeah. around Gate? What do you think caused that? Well, it's more than likely you see a lot of the salt under 
about all of this country got salt in my knee, yes. down deep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of places where these sinkholes are mm -hmm. is where there'd be fresh water running over this salt. Mm -hmm. And it'll dissolve and carry away, you know. Mm -hmm. And that'll finally just gradually sink down. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of places around over this country that's... Are there well, any on your farm? Like no, that? but right over there by Knowles, where Charlie Bond... Uh, Brother now lived. Mm -hmm. There's a quite a sink. Well, one time there's a sinkhole that's oh, about 40 feet to sunk down in the water raised up in. Yes. And there's been a lot of places that just sink down to be a crack, maybe that wide, just opened up. One time it had a big rain and that lake was pretty well full of water. And right over on the west side there's a big crack that opened up there. And that water run in there and just drained the whole lake right down there in that crack in there. Is that right? And I, they plowed up some down in there and had alfalfa there, and I was up there bailing one time. Them cracks would open up, it would be about 18 inches wide. Mm -hmm. We was going along there bailing, and the trailer wheel just dropped down in there. <laughs> That's kind of scary, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> Well, uh, you think then uh, that particular part in there has really got a, a history in geology. I believe it has. And also archaeology with yeah. the Indians. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, let's, uh, let's get back more to the present day. Um, where were you on Black Sunday? And what were you doing? <laughs> I was sitting on the west porch in the house. And there was a black cloud coming rolling in from the northwest there. And mm -hmm. Did you see it when it first came over the hill? Yeah, we seen it when it was quite a ways back there. Just, mm -hmm. just rolling. Mm -hmm. My dad and Charlie Bond and my sister Edith, they, we was all sitting there on the west porch, just sitting there watching that coming in there. Mm -hmm. And... We never started to go until it hit the trees right then. When it hit the grove, it just blacked out everything. You couldn't see nothing. And we got up and started to go in the house. And I stayed out there until my dad, he was getting pretty old and feeble then. And it took him quite a little bit to get up and get in the house. Mm -hmm. By the time he got to the house, the dark, you couldn't see the, couldn't see nothing. Mm -hmm. You couldn't see where the window was or anything. And I just rolled in there just black. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of light in the house to be able to see anything at all. Well, could you see the light? Did the light shine? Well, or pretty bright, pretty dim. Yes. You couldn't have seen it outside, but in the house, the dust wasn't mm -hmm. thick with what you could see it in the house, but mm -hmm. you should, couldn't have seen it from the outside at all. Yes. And well, did it affect your health in any way? Not anyway, as I know of. Uh, so many people couldn't breathe, you know. No, a lot of them couldn't, but it never did bother me. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess it was just one of them tough kind. <laughs> <laughs> I never did have anything poison either. Anything never has bothered me. Yes. No way. Well, well, you were lucky. Well, um, did the the uh, dirt storms, did it affect your father's farming business up there? Yes. Yeah, it's... it's because we lived on the, right on the river, and we, uh -huh. we never did run completely out of grass. Sometimes it's pretty short. Uh -huh. But we always had grass enough to run the cattle on. Uh -huh. And we always down in the bottom there could cut a little hay and put up to have feed on in the wintertime. Uh -huh. But a lot of them, had, well, that one fall when the so dry there, and the government killed so many cattle, you know. And uh -huh. the, there was several... I took in several cattle in the pasture there, the pasture because they just run plumb out of grass, and we had mm -hmm. little grass there. And my brother Joe, he brought some down there, and Big Ann brought some over there and put in there. And the government killed several cattle there in my club, but there wasn't none of them mine. Mm -hmm. They killed some cattle there and drug them off down. Did you approve of that? No, I didn't approve of it myself. I, I sold all my calves. A neighbor, John J. S. Dillon, 
and bought my calves. See, the government paid nine dollars for the calves they killed. Mm -hmm. I sold all of mine for ten dollars a head to Mr. Dillon. He come and got them. Mm -hmm. And the cows, the government paid twelve dollars a head for them, and I got fifteen for mine. I sold them to J.O. West and drove them up the creek about ten miles up there and delivered them to him. And yeah. I never sold a thing to the government. I, yeah. Everything that I sold, I sold on the market. Well, it is true, though, that uh, now further out from the river, they they had nothing to eat. They just didn't have nothing left to eat at all. And uh, there was no uh, feed for them. You couldn't you turn them into no, a field. No to, feed. There was no fields to turn them into because there just wasn't nothing growing. So, um, after all, don't you think the government kind of did the farmers a good deed? Well, they, they about had to do that. They couldn't, couldn't sell them. Uh -huh. There wasn't no buyers. No. And nobody had no feed to feed them. And nobody had any money to buy them much. They didn't have money to buy a ship and feed and mm -hmm. feed them. Mm -hmm. That's about all they could do. Mm -hmm. It looked kind of cool to do it, but yes. that's about all they could do. Well, did the owners then uh, haul the carcasses off, or what did they do with well, them? Well, most of them, just, the ones that are there, they dug them down there by the river. Mm -hmm. They weren't them. allowed to skin them and sell the hides, well, or were there any? Yeah, they could skin them if they wanted to. Well, there's once in a while, there'd be a nice calf that was pretty fat or something, and we butchered one of the calves there in, in the trail there. Mm -hmm. There's no use of throwing all that good beef away. No. And at that time, uh, every uh, people were so hard up. Yes. Uh, it looked like such a shame because there was hungry people in the United States yeah. at that time. But you couldn't get the meat to them. No, you couldn't get the meat to them. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, the Depression. Uh, you all survived the Depression, but yeah. you had some hard times, too. Sure, I had some hard times. My dad had a $4,800 mortgage on the place there, one of them federal land back mortgages. Mm -hmm. Of course, that interest had to be paid twice a year. And mm -hmm. It took a lot of digging sometimes to <laughs> get enough to pay that mortgage and that interest off. Yes. But I managed to get it paid every time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they think that people just got up and left their farms, you know, the Okies did, and went to California. Well, there's quite but a few of them that did, I guess. Was it because they just couldn't make their interest payments, as you say? Well, it probably was, um, and then they just... But the ones that stayed here and stayed put, they were better off than the others. They went off out to California or somewhere. And mm -hmm. Stayed out there and worked a while. When they come back, they didn't have nothing when they got back. Yeah. They didn't have no, no place to go place to. Place to go to or nothing. Mm -hmm. The ones that stayed was better off than the ones that left. Mm -hmm. It was pretty tough going, but the ones that stayed made a little of it. They never yeah. had none of them stars to death. That's right. Well, um, what else do you want to tell me now? Do you have some more about your river that you... Well, I've got, I can got see a lot, that of, river in a lot of river stories. That you have. Of course, that's just what's happened to me. Uh -huh. I remember one time, one Sunday morning, I'd, it was long in the spring, just from planting time, and I mm -hmm. took my saddle horse and rode out in the pasture and checked my cattle and thought I'd ride on over to my brother Joe's. They lived over there about four miles north. Went over there for dinner and went over there to get some Capricorn seed to plant. Mm -hmm. and I went over there and stayed for dinner and then from where his house was, you couldn't see the river. The river wasn't up but that, that morning. Mm -hmm. wasn't up at all. Mm -hmm. I rode over there and stayed for dinner and started to come home along in the afternoon. Rode right up on the hill and boy, the river was all the way bottom down there. So I just went back and took that Capricorn seed back and left it and rode on down there. And I rode up to the river there and I just stopped and looked at it a little bit and boy, it's really rolling waves. And every little bit there'd be another wave come and just go a little further out, it's still raising. I said, well, I'm going to cross it, just well hit it, so I rode into it. 
And by the time we got out into the river there, in the main current, the horse had to swim. And we went downstream there just about a half mile. Mm. Horse swimming all the way. Of course, we were gradually getting across this little flood that was mostly going right downstream. Mm -hmm. And we were getting down to where the river was cutting again a bank. We were going to straight up and down the bank. We couldn't get out. And I was afraid they going to get me down there. Mm -hmm. If I had, I just had to went back across the other way. Mm -hmm. But just about a hundred yards before we got down to that bank, when the horse hit bottom, we come on out. Well. And that big old way was rolling. There was rolling five or six feet high. Oh, my. And I had a young couple was standing up there with me that time, and they'd heard the river up, and they were down there on the bank watching me. They said to go plumb out of sight, and then pretty soon come up over the top of them, just riding, uh, riding them waves now. Looks like that would have been so hard on your horse, those well, waves hitting the horse. Didn't he tire? Well, ordinarily it would, but he's a horse that had been rode a lot. Mm -hmm. He had good wind and had mm -hmm. been rode a lot. And he knew the river, too. He'd mm -hmm. been rode in the river. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of difference. Yes, I imagine. Yes. And, of course, some waves there, they wasn't, wasn't big enough. They wasn't rolling over backwards like they do. So, mm -hmm. uh, they were just, just, just mm -hmm. going up and down over mm -hmm. And after I got across there, I, if, I, if I hadn't have been on the north side and went to home, I wouldn't have crossed it. That's the worst I ever did cross it. Mm. And one other time, one of my parents, my nephew, he stayed right, lived just across the road from me. And we had a big rain there one night, and the river was up pretty big. So next morning, we just took our horses and rode out and passed soon. Rode down on the south side, down to the east end, and then crossed over there and went back on the north side. Just mm -hmm. got back up to the west end there, where Clancy mm -hmm. decided to go on over to his dad's for a while. And I was going to go on home, and right there where we was at, there was just, just a narrow, narrow channel there, and there's all this deep in there, and I didn't know if I rode in there, it'd make a horse swim, it'd have to get wet. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll just go down a little further down where it spreads out and run be so deep, wouldn't, maybe wouldn't get wet. I got out just about in the middle of it there, and the horse hit some quicksand and went down. And then lunging there, trying to get out of that quicksand, he swelled up and just busted the saddle sense and left me out in the middle of the river, way down and packed my saddle <laughs> So I went yeah. back out to the north side and got out there and mm -hmm. passed up my saddle cinch enough. I, could, I went back up there and rode in the road deep. It was deep. The horse had to swim, but I was already wet. I didn't tell mm -hmm. him. <laughs> um, let's go back to the archaeology part. I remember uh, seeing your uh, picture you had with uh, some kind of drawing on a cliff. Do you remember about that? Well, I've got a book up there that the uh, archaeologist outfit sent me one time. But I, I read some of it. I don't remember much about it. But they showed several places there and described what the different layers of the rock and stuff is. Well, uh, it was a, a fish, wasn't it? Yeah, that was, that's in a bank just up this drawer that comes in. Is it on your place? No, it's just on, it was on Clarence's place there. Oh, it was up on the west of your place. Yeah, it was just kind of south mm -hmm. west. The jaw comes right down through there by the barn. Can you describe what that fish looked like? Well, it's said that uh, the bones, some of the bones we found there, oh. looked uh, like some of these bullhead catfish. Uh, they wasn't this, but they're similar to the, some of the catfish mm -hmm. that they have. Nowadays. Yes. They showed several different kinds of bones in there. Mm -hmm. If you have it up that way, I can show you that book. I can okay. it to you something sometime. Now, how deep would that be from the Well, uh, the ground? bank was about 40 feet high, I guess, and it is scattered along in that bank up through there. Oh. They just dug in there, and when they found them, they would work around there and save them bones, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there any caves or anything up in there? No, there's no caves. But Isn't the kind of soil to have caves? No. They're all caves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Mr. Otto Barbie told me about Mr. Thorburn, and he went down in some place down in there, and uh, he had a spade with him, and he got to digging along a bank, and he opened up a cave, and in it was a lot of bones. Where the in there was one tribe of Indians always carried their ancestor bones with them. And uh, evidently this tribe had, do you remember seeing such a thing as that no, or hearing anything no, like know. that? Uh, Mr. Barbie told me about it and he was there and saw it. Mm -hmm. But he never could find the place again. Yeah. Uh, this uh, uh, Mr. Thorburn fixed it back just about like it was so yeah. that um, nobody could go in there and, and then Mr. Barbie forgot where it yeah. I just wondered if uh, I'd like to locate that spot, yes. but I can't find anybody else that remembers it. I never did talk to Thorburn. There's a lot of the boys from around there that worked down there, digging there with him, but mm -hmm. I always had work to do at home, and I never did go down there and talk mm -hmm. to him or anything. Um, what did the men tell you they found whenever they'd be with uh, him digging? Well, they found several bones. Um, skulls and with the, in the Indian mm -hmm. graves. With Did it, they yeah. find any artifacts or anything buried with them? Well, I don't know. They didn't. The ones that I've seen, they never did say anything about it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, I just wondered. Okay, uh, what else do you have to tell me? Well, I, I've got down the quicksand pretty bad down to the horses. Yeah. After a flood. Well, now that quicksand comes in with the flood. Is yeah. that it? Or well, will it gradually wash out then and go? No, it finally just settles down. What it that does. quicksand is is where the water, when it's high, will wash out a deep channel, you know. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, sand will just float in there, and that water and sand, you know, is so heavy that it won't settle down. It just wash in this and be plumb. Soft. Oh, and it'll you step sink. in it, you just go down. You just through. go right down in it. Of course, of course, they'll only just go down to where the belly gets on it. Uh -huh. But they'll go come down to the belly all the time. Oh, they will. Yeah. And can they get out? Yeah, they. They'll struggle until they get yeah, out. Yeah, usually. Now the cows, they used to have trouble with them. They, a cow, when they go to bogging down, they just stop and just stand there and look. Mm -hmm. If they stand there very long, it'll set around the feet till they can't get out. Because yeah. as soon as you stir it out, that water will come out and the mm -hmm. sand will settle. Mm -hmm. And I, well, one time I had a cow that I was feeding cows down on the river bottom, and I'd, the weather man said there's a cold spell coming, so I pulled them all across the river and fed them on the south side mm -hmm. before the cold spell came. But one old cow had a calf on the north side of the river. And she went back over the tent and it turned cold that night and froze up. That cow stayed over there for a month. I couldn't get over there to get her and she couldn't get across. Mm -hmm. But she done all right. She done just good as ever. Well. And when it started to warm up in the spring, well, I thought I'd go over there and see if I could find her. And usually when the ice goes out, it'll melt out right next to the side of the bank, you know. Mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. And the water starts to run, it'll cut out a deep channel there. Mm -hmm. Then as the water as the ice melts out, the water gets pretty high, you know, and it fills that up with soft sand. Mm -hmm. and I started right across the and made all that. I got just about 10 feet of the bank. That horse just fell in all over. And of course, it, they'll wall around there and finally mm -hmm. get on out. Mm -hmm. and then one other time, as, well, that, that time as a young Mary was riding. It's the first time they'd ever been in quicksand. It didn't hardly really know how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. But there or two later then, I was riding down at the east end of the pasture, and there was another guy by the name of Bird Cell was there, and he was riding out there with me that day. And we started to go across down there. But what caused that was down there where the ditch company, down the ditch valley, down there, that takes the water out of the river. Mm -hmm. And I was going there and took these dozers and push the sand up there and make an angling ditch right up along the side of the river to turn the water over to the 
make a dam there. Yeah. And during the time that dam was in there, it come a raise there. And I ordered to make that dam about three or four foot high. Mm-hmm. And that water all run right down that there channel they made and cut that out deep. And when right over the top, that just filled up the soft sand. And I started right across there, and she just went just plumb down all over. I stepped off her, and I went in waist deep in the quicksand myself. Oh, my. And usually you can kind of lay down and just kind of crawl out, but there's just the soft, there was nothing there. And she was a floundering around there trying to get out, you know. Mm-hmm. I was afraid she was going to roll over right on top of me, and I was fast. I couldn't move a bit. But pretty soon she stopped to rest a little bit, and I reached up and got her one hand on the saddle horn. Then I could work my feet out one at a time, you know, and get loose and find after you well, settle it, just to, it'll settle down. You can stand on top of it then. After I got out of there and got loose, well, I wasn't afraid then. Yeah. And every time she'd make a jump to get out, she'd just go one step and down again. And mm-hmm. every time she'd jump, I'd pull her around and turn her around to come back out. You know? mm-hmm. And when I got out in this other guy, I rode right in behind me. And he was still sitting on his horse. She was plumb down. I told him to get off of her so she could get up, and he got off, and she got up right away because she was just right in the edge of it, but I was right out in the middle of it. And it took about a half a dozen tries before I finally got her turned around, and she finally, she just about played out, you know, and she'd had to, had to stop that rest a little bit. Mm-hmm. I was just afraid maybe she might stay too long to settle so she couldn't get out, and so I had to whip her a little to make her, mm-hmm. and she made another run, and that time she'd come on out. Um, Charlie, did you have to ever go to the war, either one of the wars? No, I no. just missed them both times. I had to register in 1918 mm-hmm. when I was 18 years old, mm-hmm. but it all ended, you know, in 19... You were lucky. You didn't have to And go. then in, in the Second World War, they had to register after 45, and I had to register again in 45, and mm-hmm. it all stopped. I missed both of them. Well, we're at the end of our tape. And I sure thank you for coming. I've enjoyed this visiting with you, and and I'm glad you came in, and we've got this on tape now. And if you want one of these here records, I'll just give it to you, and you can keep them. I've got several of them. Oh, you have? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you for coming in. Yeah, I've been wanting to do something like this for quite a while. You have in Beaver, Oklahoma at the, Pine, at the uh, Jones and Plummer Trail Museum.